This episode of The Good Stuff is brought to you in part by the web series Following in Darwin's Footsteps. So Matt, what do we, what do we have going on down there? Well, it looks like a bunch of dirty water. <laughs> that's uh, where the bugs are working. <laughs> that, that's where the bugs are? Yes. All that dirty water has come from Milwaukee, Wisconsin and its surrounding communities. Everything washed down the drain and everything flushed down the toilet comes here. And uh, how's, it, how's it smell up here, Matt? Um, I've smelled worse. It, it's not that bad, really. The treatment of wastewater is crucial to our modern way of life, so it's kind of funny that we hardly ever give it a second thought. At the Jones Island Wastewater Treatment Plant, they're doing more than cleaning our wastewater. They're turning it into something useful, fertilizer. And they've been doing it for 90 years now. Since 1926, proudly we're, uh, we're celebrating our 90th anniversary this year. This is Jeff Spence of the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District. He's agreed to take us behind the scenes and show us exactly how they do it. Because not only are they turning our poop into plant food, they're also turning it into power. First of all, the plant food they make is called Malorganite. It's a biosolids fertilizer, and the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District makes about 45,000 tons of it per year. You make it here out of the waste that comes from Milwaukee. Right. Well, it's, uh, it's, and that's a misnomer. Oh, okay. Malorganite are actually the tiny workers that are used to clean wastewater. Oh, okay. That dirty water is not only filled with waste, it's a breeding ground for all kinds of microbes, from bacteria to ciliates to amoeba. So malorganite is not poop. It, it is, is the bugs that clean the poop. It is the <laughs> bugs that actually ingest all sorts of solids that come in here. Okay. So you're adding air, mm -hmm. you're growing bugs, they've got a food source in all of the organic materials that are coming in. Mm -hmm. And as long as we're providing that, the bugs will continue to, to replicate. We're using ecosystems on an industrialized scale, very similar to what you see in nature. If you think about a swamp and how a swamp reclaims organic material, mm -hmm. it's very similar. It's a biological process yeah. uh, for cleaning water. And it has been called one of the largest recycling programs in the world. And not only are they recycling our waves, the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District is using renewable energy to power their facilities. By 2035, we hope to be uh, using 100% of our energy from uh, renewable sources. At least one of those sources is the bugs themselves, right? They, Absolutely. Uh, well, why don't we um, take a look at the facilities here and see how Great. it's done. To see how this is possible, Jeff took us inside the swamp to give us a little behind the scenes peek at how it all works. Two things. It's not as dirty as people would think, and nope. you don't see a lot of people. What's the temperature like in here? I don't know, it's, it's, it's pretty balmy in here. It's like a, yeah, a little humid. <laughs> so these units are called belt filter presses. We're pumping the uh, bugs and water, and we're gonna squeeze out the water. Yeah, so it's like sort of like ringing out a rag. Right. And so this, like, the chunk in the water here, is that bugs? Those is are that, bugs. Because they, at this point, they've basically eaten up all the waves. That's right? correct. And all that, we just got these fat, fat bacteria. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You see the water squeezed out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it just kind of looks like mud. And people would think that, you know, the smell would be god-awful. It it's, doesn't smell bad at all. It, it just smells like like dirt, like it's like an earthy smell. Certainly better than if this was like a bunch of poop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so that's the material that's oh. coming out. Yeah, it's like flattening it like yeah. to a little bacteria pancake. Why don't we take a look up here? Sorry, right, so I can touch it. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> it feels like cake, like a sponge cake, and I see on there it's called a sludge cake transport. <laughs> yes, it's called, once it, a lot of water is squeezed out, yeah. and it's in that form, it's called cake. Yeah. <laughs> and so from here it's conveyed to the dryer, and we'll show you those dryers. All right, this will give you a sense of the magnitude of a, the size of a dryer. As you can see, they're about the length of a city bus and probably just as tall. I think a double-decker bus. So why don't we take a look at the heat dry product? Yeah. It's hard to see, but um, yeah. basically so it's, like a big, it's like a big like tumbler, kind of. Oh, yeah. 
just touch it. It's it's warm, but it's not hot. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean it feels like pebbles kind of. Yeah. Right. And so from here, the product is shipped to screening. Okay. And then it's stored in the silos. The best way to get a sense of the silos is from the outside. So okay. we're going to go outside now. These silos okay. right here is where the product is stored. On average, like how much um, malorganite is made, um, like per day? Per day, on average, it's about 120 tons per day. How much turf could you um, fertilize oh, with 120 that's a great tons? You know, <laughs> that's a great question. So. A bag will tip. A bag of 36 pounds will typically typically cover about 2,500 square feet. Okay. So. So 120 tons is a pretty significant area of it's land. It's a significant amount. Okay, if I did my math right, 120 tons of malorganite should be able to fertilize about 17 million square feet of land in one day. So at that pace, they should be able to fertilize an area of land the size of Milwaukee in a little under six months. All right, so we're now at our South Shore Water Reclamation Facility. Uh, this is an anaerobic digestion facility. Yeah, so we're standing on top of the, the digester, the anaerobic digester right now. It's below our feet. That's correct. Through this facility, we're generating energy to run the facility. At the other facility, it's an aerobic digester. We saw it as like those pools of water that were being aerated. Here is it's anaerobic, which means they're basically deprived oxygen. That's right? correct. And but it's sort of the same thing, right? The microbes are eating the the sludge, right? They're and, eating the, the organic materials that are coming in, and they're putting off uh, methane gas. Yeah, and that gets burned to make electricity. Right, and that's used to run our our generators here. Um, yeah. So our goal is to run this entire plant off of the energy or the methane that's generated here. So whenever people, um, you know, whatever they're washing down their, their sinks or flushing into the, the toilet, toilet, flushing yeah. the toilet, it's, it's creating power here. Yeah. You know, I, I think water is taken for granted. It, it's always supposed to come out of the faucet um, yeah. and you just let it go away and you don't really think about it. And the only time to think about it really is when it, like the water doesn't work, you know, yeah. or it's clogged or something like that. Or you um, don't have it. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of communities around the world are struggling with this, that issue. And, and we here in the Midwest have this plentiful resource. Mm -hmm. It's not a never ending resource, but it's plentiful. And we should be good stewards of that resource. So, what do you think? Is poop the next great power source, or is Milwaukee just full of shit? Let us know in the comments. This episode has been made possible in part by Following in Darwin's Footsteps. Following in Darwin's Footsteps is a web series of short films from the University of Pennsylvania that explores our understanding of evolution. A link to their website is in the description below. And here's our producer, Ryan Wolf, with some more interesting facts about particles and physics and secrets of the universe in general. Thanks, Matt, and thank you for watching. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe. And if you'd like to support us, head on over to Patreon and become a supporter. So in our last video, we talked about the almost but not quite particle that the LHC might have discovered back in 2015. Here's what you guys had to say about that. Someone775 wonders when they are going to build a bigger and better device. That would be cool. If the LHC is unable to find a new particle, it might be that the energy isn't high enough, in which case, you gotta build a bigger accelerator. In fact, there was going to be a much bigger particle accelerator called the Superconducting Super Collider, which was going to be built in Texas, but it was canceled in 1993 due to the government being lame. But fortunately, Ali R pointed out that China is actually planning on building a bigger accelerator starting in 2020, which aims to be at least twice the size of the LHC and up to seven times as powerful. It's probably gonna take a while to build though, so it's possible that we'll have to wait till at least 2030 before any new data comes in. But it could turn out that that accelerator won't even be powerful enough to detect any new fundamental particles. And it's possible that some of the answers that we're looking for can't actually be found in particle accelerators at all. Which brings us to an interesting thought posted by Maura Nauer, who writes, I sometimes wonder if what causes more existential anguish to theoretical physicists could be that, regardless of how far we've come in our understanding of the universe, both at a large and a tiny scale, we could soon reach the limit of our capacity to research or understand it. We're flawed, after all. This is actually kind of a scary thought for me. 
Part of what makes us human, I think, is the desire to learn new things and explore the unexplored. If there comes a time when there's nothing more that we can discover, well, that would kind of suck. I forwarded this comment along to Andre de Govea, who I interviewed in the last video, to see if this is something that bothers him as well. It seems like, at least from the theorist side, there's not too much to worry about. There's still so much out there that we've observed that we have no proven explanation for to keep theorists occupied for a long, long time. However, there could be a bit more existential anguish on the experimental side of physics. It's possible that there could come a time when we're just not able to ask new experimental questions or observe new phenomena in the Earth or in the cosmos. For example, we could run out of space to build a larger particle accelerator at some point, or maybe there's a limit to how far out into space we could see. Certain theories like string theory or the multiverse might actually be impossible to test for. But if history has taught us anything, it's that whenever we think we have things figured out, something new and surprising always comes up, and there's every reason to believe that we'll continue to come up with new and clever ways of exploring nature. So there you go. It may actually be that our limited understanding and our flaws ensures that there will always be new things to learn and discover. Coming up next, Craig talks with a man who was once a vegan but is now a butcher. Why, you ask? Find out next time on The Good Stuff. <laughs> Why are we always doing videos this way? I don't know. It just, it just felt right. <laughs>